Good afternoon. I'm Holly Weeks, moderating, moderating our first of two afternoon panels, responding to our morning, morning panel on barriers to leadership. We're now going to, in an afternoon, solve the problems of barriers to leadership. What's your thinking on the relationship between these various definitions of leadership and barriers to it? In this um, hyper uh, connected, uber network, globalized world, uh, increasingly what we're seeing is that some of the most effective leaders and change agents, they leave their mark by their ability to create and um, to build and mobilize new communities um, through social entrepreneurism and other innovative approaches to uh, try to approach global issues like health, sanitation, education, uh, gender and income inequality. Leadership is when you can mobilize people towards a cause and get that work done. I'm a great believer that if you have scarce resources, what you want to do is have the greatest impact, greatest good with the, with the resources you have. And I think that could happen from positions of authority and it could happen from positions where you do not have authority. So the question for me and our discourse today and what I listen to everybody else was, what are the ways in which um, people can emerge uh, with readiness in a society and have the, uh, the, the opportunity have the, and have the capacity or, or get the capacity and get the networks or whatever they need to be able to have disproportionate impact in their societies. A lot of folks who don't didn't grow up with civic training, coming in from strong institutions, sort of don't view themselves as leaders. It's not a part of their imagination, even though they have tremendous followings that they can deliver with consistency, um, and they have tremendous talents, um, some introverted, some articulate, some not. Um, and so I think, particularly in the context of this discussion, thinking about leaders through that kind of broad brushstroke, and then thinking about gaps within an existing talent set in order to strengthen one's capacity to deliver a following is really important, particularly in public life. I would like to hear your thoughts to how we both encourage people to assume informal leadership positions. So if you're fostering a community in which in each individual feels that he or she has the potential, then you've got a movement that it's a leadership movement, not just an individual, that makes the cause possible. And I recognize that as I say that, I hear echoes of ISIS. I mean, any group would make the same argument. And so then I think we have to decide how we, how we choose, and I think it is a choice, how we choose our movements. Which movements do we accept that will allow one person to die because we know the 12 more will arise in their place? So the question really for us is, what kind of leadership can achieve as much positive result for societies in a way which other societies would be comfortable with? Because that then brings in the issue of being able to live with your neighbors and globalization. So I would like to make sure that we don't, don't talk randomly about leadership of any kind of sector or any kind of group and any kind of activity and that the evidence of leadership is numbers with persistency and consistency. Uh, I think it's within the human condition that leaders do arise and uh, continually, and when they're cut down, others do arise to take their place. That is not to say that there is not a need, maybe a crying need in some parts of the world, for uh, people of goodwill to support the kind of leadership that's aligned with the values that Benazir Bhutto, for instance, uh, embodied. I think one of the ways that you do stay alive as a leader um, is through alliances and stay alive in the sense of both physically stay alive and also stay in the game enough so that you have the capacity to to bring about change. What we have found at Eisenhower Fellowships, international leaders deeply value the connections that they can get from having allies on the outside, the tools and resources that can be put at their disposal so that they don't feel so alone, the information that would be available to them uh, to help guide them uh, when and in the way they need it. Uh, for instance, Daniel Bell, his, his book about whether Chinese enlightened authoritarianism and meritocracy is more functional in delivering the benefits that the people really want than um, the present state of 
of, uh, of uh, for instance, American-style democracy. So There's an argument to be made, and I think the country you know, voted uh, in a direction that was about a needs-based politic rather than a values-based politic. Uh, and I personally, and my partisan affiliations are probably pretty obvious, but I personally think it's that's how a democracy unravels. And I think a lot of countries do that, and I think it makes a lot of sense, uh, particularly in dire economic times. But there has to be a certain baseline of values, and I think shared values are the only thread that ever, that unite a nation over time, whatever those values may be in a respective politic. And and it, how do we align? Or how do we work well? How do we overcome barriers to leadership if we are either far apart, uh, people who have assets and come into and want to be of assistance and our track record is imperfect? What should we be doing differently? Behind, behind the question of trust lies the question of intent. But you know, listening to the conversation this morning, I heard an argument for recognizing shared values. And I think this is where Kimball's contribution you know, sounds loudest, but negotiating to get there, recognizing differences across cultures, appreciating the importance of valuing those differences, but at the same time looking for the, the common ground. I don't think you quite used that phrase, but still, you know, what, on what basis can we talk to one another? How do you build trust? It's, it's a feeling of person to person, even if in actuality it isn't. And most of the time, you ha it has to be person to person. Every leader develops the next layer of, its, of his allies and whatever by personal contact. I know Bill, I know Jim, I know Susan, I know. So personal contact and personal relationships are very important. So then, okay, so now you're there, you have a personal relationship, you drink together. Uh, now, how do you arrive at enough commonality to be able to get stuff done that both sides want done? So you have to understand each other's intentions, each other's needs, and the needs of those behind each other. And so, this process of understanding is cultural, it's factual, and it's emotional. So when we talk about leadership training and leadership empowerment, we have to keep in mind how do you build personal relationships and do that effectively. And, and then in the interest of urgency and time and limited resources, which, who should be p building relationships? Who should we support first to build relationships, to get stuff done that will then create more possibility of getting more stuff done. My question is, if we don't have women players much involved, and we would like to, how do we do what we're talking about doing when they have no reputation, they have, there, there's much they don't have? So I think what this fellowship does is it's an important piece, it's obviously not the only piece, in building a better pipeline. And I think um, there are real barriers in national security, in politics, in science, in all these kind of male-dominated industries. There's not a talent gap. There's an investment in that talent gap. Last year, we had uh, a program devoted entirely to women leaders from around the world, 25 women leaders in the United States for seven-week individualized fellowships. Of the 25, six were actually from this arc of trouble. So that was a quarter of our entire program. It was... Uh, concretely what you're thinking of doing and the same principles apply. Uh, those women uh, bonded immediately and this group, this cohort, was like a sub-cohort within the larger group uh, and the, the big, what we tried to do is support them in every way possible to promote their engagement with each other during the fellowship but more importantly afterwards. Like Asad and I are in the same cohort at the Kennedy School. It's an it's a mixed bag. I don't know if we have anything in common in terms of our backgrounds as a unit of, you know, 60 or so, some odd people. But we have some common values and commitment to public service. We're, and the learning to Holly's question of whether it's an institution that's sort of imposing something, I think what's been so incredible and kind of in a good way, very surprising about the Kennedy School is that the learning has been, my learning has been primarily from my classmates and it's been about strengthening my own values in the context of a communications course or an ethics course or a you know whatever course rather than melding closer to Assad or melding closer to professors. Is there going to be something an expectation of some action in return when they go back? 
uh, and that's for you to figure out. And then what would that be? But we do. We and then we monitor the project and try to provide them with resources, particularly with connections of people who could be collaborators to help them. The other thing is we've instituted. We think is really important a requirement that they mentor that they mentor somebody. Mm -hmm. And then they all return back where there is a network already in their country. The touchstone, what kinds of, of, of bridges do we build to American or American hemisphere organizations that have the same interests so that that then becomes a force multiplier if correctly managed? Mm -hmm. Alliances of institutions and resources, it may be the way to answer your question about how can we as relatively small scale initiators of something that might have large implications, how could we carry that forward and carry it forward with urgency and effectiveness? And in terms of building critical mass, so with the implosion of the news industry in the last few years, we've been wrestling with that certainly at the Neiman Foundation, both to keep up the quality of candidates uh, for this very prestigious fellowship, but also uh, to make sure that there's a continuous impact on the field, which you can argue needs it more than ever now. So one thing they've come up with that I think is really smart in these circumstances, besides the full year, the full boat Neiman Fellowship, which is a full academic year at Harvard, uh, we've come up with visiting fellowships, which is at the same time, besides the, it's about two dozen, it's about the same size as us. It's a uh, ideal sort of size for a fellowship class. Uh, two dozen, half Americans, half international. They also do uh, each, they do three sets of two uh, visiting fellowships for three months. And so all of a sudden, besides the 24, you have uh, six more. So you're adding 25% extra impact at uh, the price of one more fellow, basically, each year. So how do you perform triage about geography? types of occupation or potential occupation, stage of career, are we talking midlife or early? Early, you have a greater risk that you won't get success, you need larger numbers, and it takes a longer time. Mid-career, they don't have as much time to spend in a program, so you have to be efficient in, and convince them that what they do with you or supported by you will help them be more effective at what they want to do. And then, I mean, so there are all kinds of things about what you choose to do, how much, does, how does that match to resources, and how does that match to the priorities that we as, the, as donors or organizers uh, have, and how do we determine those priorities, and then share them with the potential applicant pool out there and get them to contact us. These are all, see I'm focusing on a lot of operational questions which, which you need to ask in order to actually determine what do we do to address this gigantic, humongous elephant in the room, which is how do we address uh, this shared feeling that there needs to be more leadership, better leadership, more effective leadership.